Good afternoon or good morning, if it's morning to you. A very warm welcome to UCL Rare Books Club and thank you to Bentham's Body Ensemble for recording that music, especially for me to use in today's event. Um, my name is Dr Tabitha Tuckett and I am the Rare Books Librarian here at University College London. And I'm welcoming you to the last in our series this summer of UCL Rare Books Club. Um, it's also, as it happens, the last in the series that will be programmed uh, by me as I'm going to be moving jobs from UCL Special Collections to um, a combination of lectureship and uh, librarian roles at John Rylands University in Manchester here in the UK and at UCL. But don't fear, Special Collections will, we hope, be running this programme or something very similar next summer. And I shall also be running events programmes on rare books next summer as well. So there'll be plenty for you in the future. And thank you for all your support over the last seven years that I've been running this series. We've got some other people to thank behind the scenes. We have Erica Delbeck, who's managing our Zoom, and she is our head of rare books here at UCL Special Collections. And we have Sarah Pipkin, who is our Outreach and Exhibitions Coordinator, and she is also up behind the scenes on the technical side. We are going today to have two wonderful speakers from the US talking about Galileo. Um, they're going to be talking about the publication history of the first edition of Il Saggiatore in 1623. They're going to speak and give a presentation. And then we're going to have a look at our copy here at University College London. And then we're going to take questions. So just to introduce our speakers, we're going to hear from uh, Professor Nick Wilding. He is Professor of History at the uh, Georgia State University in the US. And he teaches and researches on um, early modern history of science, but he's also gained a reputation for uh, spotting uh, forgeries of Galileo. And joining him, we have uh, Jason W. Dean, who is Vice President for Collections and Public Services at the wonderful Linda Hall Library of Science, Engineering and Technology, and that's in Missouri in the US. We thank you both very much for joining us here at what for you is first thing in the morning. So we really appreciate that. Um, I'm going to hand straight over to the two of you and we'll hear your talk and then we'll have a look at the UCL uh, copy. So over to both of you. Thanks very much, Tabitha. Um, <clears throat> so welcome. Uh, thanks for the invite to um, for this audience today. Um, and I'd like to kind of give a shout out at the start of this to uh, librarians everywhere. Uh, this has been a really kind of collaborative work. We've done a mini census of a few dozen copies of the Sagittore, uh, and we've relied really heavily on the, um, the labor and goodwill of rare book librarians around the world. So what we're going to do today is uh, I'll kick off talking a little bit about the uh, the occasion of the writing of Il Saggiatore. Then Jason will take you into the our discoveries uh, of the the book itself, the um, uh, our new bibliographical findings, and then we'll discuss the uh, specific nature of uh, the UCL copy. So first up, um, Saggiatore published in 1623 in um, in Rome. It's a book about comets. Um, why, you may ask, do comets uh, matter at all? Um, well, a little bit of background. Uh, in 1610, or end of 1609, 1610, Galileo adapted and improved on the telescope and very quickly in the space of three or four years made pretty much every astronomical discovery that you could make with uh, the kind of telescope he was using. So uh, arguments about um, turning the moon into an Earth-like planet and then and therefore the uh, Earth into a moon-like planet, um, discovery of sunspots, uh, observation of the phases of Venus, um, gradually building evidence for what he saw, physical evidence, observational evidence for what he saw as um, 
uh, overtoppling the Aristotelian Ptolemaic system, which had the Earth at the center of the world, and proposing instead that there was uh, good hard data, not just a, a, a nice mathematical calculating trick, but good hard physical data to back up Copernicus's um, notion of a heliocentric universe. Uh, in 1616, um, this comes into uh, kind of comes to a head that the the theological issues that this um, this argument raises and the strength with which Galileo was making these arguments lead to the banning of uh, heliocentrism as a uh, kind of viable physical description of uh, cos the cosmos. And so uh, Galileo, after 1616, is looking for new, new uh, data, new observational uh, data that can um, give him the further evidence to reopen this debate and overturn the banning of Copernicanism and allow him ultimately to publish his uh, Dialogo, which he does in uh, 1632, um, thinking that he's on much safer ground at that point, but then Im immediately um, is taken to trial and is ordered to uh, recant and spends the rest of his life under various forms of uh, arrest. So the Sagittarius is this kind of um, a, a weird moment in the in the history of Galileo's thought. Um, the occasion, the kind of physical occasion for it is that in 1618, three comets appear, um, and they, be because of these kind of higher stakes of comet observations, obviously, if comets are hurtling through the um, celestial spheres and can be proved to be passing between planets then um, that's going to you know, literally break open the, uh, the cosmos of uh, Aristotle and Ptolemy. So all eyes are on the comets, apart from Galileo's, because he's, um, he's sick in bed when these comets appear. So he's on the kind of defensive. Uh, the first, first books to come out, um, there's this De Tribus Cometis from 1619, um, just uh, no author's name, just uh, one of the Jesuits uh, writes it. And then that, um, because the Jesuits had uh, played a large role under the figure of uh, Bellarmine in uh, the banning of Copernicanism, uh, Galileo's previously good relationships with, with Jesuits are starting to, um, to become a little less uh, happy. And so when, they, when the Jesuits put forward their arguments about the, the nature of comets, and they're basically saying that they can be used as evidence of the Tychonic system, so Tycho Brahe system, a compromise heliogeocentric system, uh, which is designed to kind of defang Copernicanism, uh, Galileo is on the defensive. So with one of his uh, friends and students, um, he publishes in 1619 the Discorso della Comete under um, Mario Guiducci's name, but largely written, we know from surviving manuscripts, largely written by Galileo himself. Um, and that then elicits uh, the next uh, book in this series, um, the Libra Astronomica, so the kind of the balance, the astronomical balance, um, where uh, a pseudonym, an anagrammatic pseudonym, Lothario Sarsio, who is actually um, Horatio Grass, Horatio Grassi, a Jesuit priest in Rome, um, takes uh, Guiducci to task um, and uh, weighs his arguments with this uh, astronomical balance. And then it takes Galileo a surprisingly long time, several years, because of uh, various illnesses uh, and just trouble writing, but he uh, trying to work out how to frame this book um, without without causing basically a, a civil war, but trying to be as rude as possible to the uh, Jesuits under a veneer of civility. And so what he does is takes the entire Libra Astronomica of um, Grassi and uh, basically writes a commentary on every single sentence of it, reprints the entire book and uh, demolishes it with this incredibly witty, uh, but from our point of view, scientifically quite weak um, 
just a, an exercise in skeptical reading, basically, this book, Il Saggiatore. Uh, it's a piece of prose uh, genius. It's very, very entertaining. And even when the um, scientific ideas are completely uh, baseless, um, it's kind of required reading. It's possibly Galileo's greatest uh, scientific writing. So the Sagittore comes out from a Roman publisher, um, Mascardi, the biggest printer or biggest publisher in Rome um, in 1623. And it is um, published under the uh, patronage of Federico Cesi and the Lincean Academy, the first scientific academy in Europe. Um, and as it's published, it's um, or during its publication, uh, a pope dies, a new pope is elected, and various Lynchian uh, academicians um, line up for uh, patronage within the new papal court of Urban VIII. And at that point, I'll hand over to Jason to take you into the book and show how that kind of context and uh, of its writing actually impacts its physical nature. Well, uh, yes, that, thanks, Nick. That, uh, I, I think that you've highlighted one of the things that's really come to the fore for me in this process, which is something that I, I feel like, to my mind, is self-evident, but something that I think revealed itself to a number of other people in this process, which is Galileo uh, is among the most well-documented early modern scientists, both from contemporary sources and secondary sources, and combining those sources, especially his correspondence and his the, letters and records of his correspondence with the team uh, with bibliographical evidence um, can help us shed some new light on the production, uh, specifically of Sagittari, but of his kind of collective body of works as well. I don't want to call it his opere because that has loaded meaning in this context. Uh, but what I'll start with is this brief bibliographical description that I worked up of University College London's um, copy, which is a transcription of the title page uh, you see the collation there. It's a quarto book printed on Metzana paper. Um, a shout out to Paul Needham for uh, reverse engineering the size of the paper, um, which he then shared how he did and has now escaped my brain. And so I'll have to go back to my notes to figure out how he determined that. Um, the things that I want to point out this afternoon for uh, you all that are with us today and that we'll look at in the University College of London copy are the second signature of, of 2 pi 1, We'll look at this uh, cancel half sheet, the 1.4, which is a conjugate uh, cancel there. And then this kind of funny business here at the end, the bracketed 2G2 minus 1. Uh, we'll talk about that as well. Um, we'll talk about uh, a cancel and, and all sorts of things. Um, but first, just a moment to, to say that uh, as we often get, as rare book librarians and curators often get, how many books were printed? Well, uh, I have good news. Uh, we figured that out. Uh, actually, we didn't figure that out. Uh, we had some other folks that had figured it out, and it's recorded in um, Galileo's correspondence in the Opera. So, in a letter from Francesco Saluti to Galileo, dated September 8, 1623, he states that there will be up to 20 engravings in the book, which is an accurate number of the engravings in the book if you count the portrait, which we look at, um, and uh, the engraved title page, which we uh, just saw while Nick was speaking. Uh, and then he goes on to say that there are a total of 12,000 engravings printed. You do some maths, as you all across the Atlantic would call it, uh, boom, you have a, a edition size of, of approximately 600 uh, copies uh, for Sagittari. I just thought that was some nice, neat math to do. Uh, and so, uh, Tabitha, when people come in to UCL and ask you how many copies, you can say 600. Um, so now I'm going to look at uh, the, the the first of kind of the five. We initially started out calling them units um, of Sagittari. Uh, the first one, which we uh, were uh, looking at with Tabitha just before we started this program, uh, is the portrait. Um, you see on the left uh, from the Linda Hall Library copy of uh, the book on sunspots printed in 1613. A portrait of Galileo with what I guess is probably a removed uh, library stamp from his beard, which seems an interesting place to put a library stamp. Uh, and you notice on the right, it's almost exactly the same image. Uh, it's certainly uh, the same engraved plate. Uh, the dimensions are a little different because one uh, has been trimmed more and they're making the same size in the slideshow. But you see one important difference, and this is the first thing that we noticed is that uh, 
Zelimena, the engraver for both the portrait and the engraved title page, uh, has now signed his name. So this is a gap of 10 years between the appearance of the book on sunspots uh, and the Sagittore. And I, it, it surprised me a little bit that someone would intentionally keep a plate. The other thing that we noticed in uh, the there were two dozen copies that were looked at, approximately two dozen copies, is that this portrait is in some copies and is not in others. And there does not seem to be a logic to its inclusion. We can make some assertions about that, about other parts of the book that are similar, similarly found or not found in a copy that exists. Uh, the portrait, though, I think it is a very much an open question because this is a fairly well-known image of Galileo. If you were hunting for an illustration of Galileo, say for your office wall, I don't have one, just to be clear. But if you want one for your office wall, this would be a great one uh, to put up. And so I could uh, see both this portrait not being included when the book was found, uh, but also it being excised at some point in its life for someone that desired an image um, of Galileo. Uh, we've looked at the plate dimensions between the two. This is the same plate. It has the same uh, kind of incidental scratches on the plate, uh, but Villamena again added his signature there at the bottom. Next, we'll talk about the uh, second uh, kind of variable unit of Sagittari, and this is Signature lowercase a, if you remember the formula that I showed you before. Signature a is comprised of two laudatory poems uh, praising Galileo, uh, one in Latin by Johannes Faber, the other in Italian by Francesco Stamutin. Um, these poems appear seemingly at random uh, in copies. Some have them and some do not. We assert in our piece, uh, which I should say we're, we're basing uh, our presentation today and extracting our work uh, for an article that's coming out sometime before the end of this year in Gal Galileana. Uh, and so in our article, we, we, uh, we assert that this signature, lowercase a, likely had a different distribution network than the main body uh, of the text of a book. Um, it is... Signature A is both found in and not found in Galilean presentation copies. Um, so there is, uh, <laughs> we have some questions about how uh, this was, uh, about how this was distributed. Uh, the little a though, I should say the lowercase a does imply that uh, the creator of these and the printer of these, uh, of this initial signature uh, intended for it to go before the main body of the text. It's a clear indication that it should go before uh, capital A. Um, so the regular book runs from A to 2F. Um, yeah. And so next, uh, speaking of uh, uppercase uh, A, let's look at that for a moment. Uh, this was one of the, I think, the fun things that as we got stuck into really looking at the book and looking at, as I said before, the epistolary evidence that uh, kind of came to the fore, which is um, that the majority of the book had been printed uh, before the title change for Virginia Cesarini. You see his birth and death dates there. He uh, was in the uh, Pope's household and he was uh, Camarieri Secreto. Uh, my apologies, my, my Italian is not as elegant as Nick says, uh, but I'm working on it. Uh, so initially, when the book uh, went into print, he was Camerari Secreto, but during the process of printing the book, he was appointed Maestro de Camera, and Cesarini was an uh, important person for both the Lynche and also for Galileo, and they felt very strongly that his new title needed to be reflected in the book. And so what the, what, uh, what the Lynche, Chasey, and uh, Galileo decided to do was to essentially remove um, half of the sheet in signature A, uppercase A, and replace it, as you see here, with this half sheet canceler, conjugate cancel. So that's the plus minus one point that we're showing with its conjugate there. Um, and what I've done here is construct an image, assuming that those two intervening leaves are not there. Um, these are, and this is the cancel page. And if you get, if you're really curious during a Q&A, uh, we've got statistics about how we know that this is, uh, there's physical evidence that demonstrates that this is canceled. We found very few watermarks consistently in this signature. Next in uh, that we found in, uh, and this was fairly well known when we started this process, uh, you see in the upper left-hand corner an inverted diagram on page 120. 
Um, this was discovered um, late in the printing process, and rather than <laughs> go to the time, effort, and expense of inserting a half sheet, uh, cancel as they did in A. Here on page 120, um, Mascardi and Galileo and Lucchese decided to, in, to create uh, just uh, cancel slips to correct the diagrams. And so on some copies, and this again is distributed separately from the bulk of the book. Um, and so those recipients who had copies of the corrected diagram, you see on the right hand side, they just paste them into their copy of the book. Um, some of the distribution channels had access to this, um, some did not. And so you see it, as you see, oh, the Lint, our copy here at Linda Hall does not have it. The copy at UCL London does, if I remember correctly, does not have the corrected diagram, but the one at Oklahoma does. I should say that that half sheet cancel in A with uh, Ocesarini is found in all copies that we were able to look at either ourselves or with uh, our collaborators on this project. Now we turn to the most pain in the neck part of the book, which is the errata. Uh, you see here uh, the um, first state of 2F as we describe it in uh, our article. This is the first state of the errata. Uh, and Galileo received a copy of the book with this 16 item errata in Florence and nearly lost his mind. Uh, the text itself was riddled with errors. Um, he, of course, uh, blamed people not named Galileo um, and felt very strongly that there should be a number of corrections. So that's we identify this as the 16 item errata, or in our article, we identify this by its title, the Aurora. There you see a nice device at the end. The kind of final conclusion, and I'm doing this chronologically backwards, final conclusion to the errata problem is uh, the addition of a tabula, which you see here, which is the recto inverso of 2F6. This would actually be a cancel, so it'd be uh, 2F6 plus minus 6. Um, what was required to accommodate all of the corrections that Galileo demanded minus some, uh, and adding in some other corrections that the Chasey and some intervening parties wanted to add to the book, was it required a reset of uh, 2F, which is 2F6, which you see here on the left, uh, to include the rest of the text from what would have been the verso of 2F, and then to have an entire uh, face of the, the relief here to uh, replicate, and to print the um, all of the errata found throughout the book. This is from the copy of the Fisher Library from the University of Toronto. Um, you see here, it's a it's a cancel leaf. You can see the stub that it's mounted on on the other side. Um, so inserted, the sheet was the leaf was removed and then inserted on that stuff. This has 136 errors, by the way. That's the other way you know that, uh, which one you have as well as seeing the tabula in the set. And then finally, we have uh, the kind of intermediary. So I, I did this a little out of order because this is what's found in the UCL copy. Um, so first you have the Sistine item errata. Galileo is very frustrated and causes in Florence this uh, half sheet insertion to be printed, uh, which is the Nota di Arori, which has 209 items in it, so longer than the tabula. Um, and if it weren't for this bifolium that exists uh, at the Fisher Library Toronto, again, um, we might not have picked up on the fact that this is a uh, this is a, this is a half sheet insertion which is intended to, as you see on the left, and we'll see in a few minutes when we look at the UCL copy, uh, the, the, the first part of the text there on the left is intended to be trimmed out and pasted over the 16 item errata. And then the sheet that you see, uh, which is uh, two, uh, 2G2, directly in verso, will be inserted in at the end. That's not consistently done. Some copies just have it inserted at the end as a, as a bifolium, making it uh, bracket 2G. Uh, and some copies have it as the UCL copy does, pasted as Galileo was probably intended in the machine inserted. I think the, the, the thorniest part of this work, uh, and uh, I'll, I'll get Nick to jump in here, um, was getting people to look at watermarks, which if any of you all have ever tried to look at watermarks in uh, books in portrait format, you know the pain that we and our collaborators felt trying to track uh, watermarks. 
Uh, there are a number of watermarks in the book. Uh, it's, uh, and I'm sure Nick will talk about this in a second, but um, it should be no surprise that it was also maybe lightly disappointing for kind of convenience sake um, that Mastardi decided to use paper stocks that he had on hand to print the book as needed. Uh, yeah, so Nick, do you want to step in? Sure. So, um... These, this is a sample of some of the watermarks we found. If we go to the next slide, um, this is the mess that we want to present to you. Um, so we've color coded each of those uh, watermarks. It doesn't matter what color really uh, is linked to what watermark. But um, on the so vertically, we're moving through the book. We have the uh, preliminaries at the top and the um, errata sheet or the, the end of the book at the, at the bottom. Uh, and then um, moving left to right, we're basically going through lots and lots of, of different copies. The reason we wanted to uh, undertake this um, fool's errand was that um, there's a reference in the uh, Galileo correspondence to fine paper copies. And Galileo is told, you know, check when you get the bale of books of 50 copies that you're being sent, there are eight fine paper copies for your distribution to Florentine friends. This has led to a, um, a bizarre phenomenon among uh, certain book dealers to claim that, they've only, that there were only eight fine paper copies uh, ever printed, and that uh, these copies are incredibly rare um, and therefore worth a lot of money. So there's a copy on sale at the moment for, I think, about a quarter of a million um, because it's a fine paper copy. Uh, I was, well, we were both skeptical of this claim that uh, that you would only print eight fine paper copies out of an edition of 600. That seemed like a lot of labor to uh, keep that paper stock separate and a very small fine paper um issue so we thought and and we also realized that no dealer had actually ever described the paper that uh helped them identify it as a, a fine paper copy there was just this this is on fine paper so that's why we looked at the uh paper at, at the watermarks and what we found is that so those copies on the right where they are mainly comprised of the black coded uh watermark those are what we think are um, fine paper copies. The provenance of some of those copies fits well with, if we look at the binding, uh, there aren't, um, I don't think, there are only a few ins inscribed copies from Galileo, but you can reconstruct um, the early provenance of some of these copies um, quite with a high degree of uh, certainty. So there are fine paper copies, um, mainly made out of the uh, one kind of paper, but you can see that that paper was also used right across the rest of the copies, the ordinary paper copies. Um, and we're, we've never really encountered something like this, and we don't know whether anybody out there in the, in the book world uh, has undertaken a similar study or um, is able to really explain what's going on. To my mind, it looks as though we know that the book, that they started printing the book with sheet uppercase A, signature A. And I think that they might have just decided to print it all on fancy paper. And then at a, and they did all of B as well. Um, C is mainly on unwatermarked paper. And then around D, it looks like they start to maybe cut costs. They realize that the, um, that they, are going to save money by using cheaper paper. But then there are also these bands like O, which are almost all on the good paper, and uh, double C through to double E. It's tempting to see this as, as evidence of several presses running concurrently, and that's quite likely. We don't know how many presses Mascardi had, but he was the largest printer in, in Rome at the time, and he was issuing usually between one and two dozen uh, publications a year. Um, we see this as evidence as well of the uh, the kind of disjunction uh, or the um, uh, the various political events that took place while the Sagittore was being printed. Uh, so one pope dies, there's a conclave, and then uh, another pope, um, Urban VIII, is elected. 
And that means that for a printer like Mascardi, he issues lots and lots of job printing, news pamphlets. And those are the uh, high turnover, quickly printed um, publications that are the bread and butter of early modern print shops. And they would uh, disrupt the printing of the book, which is the slow burner. It's not really making um, as much money. Um, and so I think that might be one reason why so many paper stocks are, are being used and why there's such disorder. But what this what this image really gives us is a kind of snapshot of precisely the, the lack of um, order. This is not a Model T Ford assembly line that we're looking at. This is stacks of paper lying around a room and grabbing a pile and shuffling them. And um, no two copies that we've seen so far have the same run of, of watermarks in them, um, which is not what we would expect. If you read kind of standard accounts of, of print history, it, you have an idea that things are much more orderly than, than this. So that's just a kind of uh, a little glimpse into the pr production process. Um, what I'd like to do now is talk about the, specifically about the uh, UCL copy, <laughs> because it has, um, maybe we can, can we bring that under the camera um, on the title page? Is that possible while, while we talk or um, what, what makes this copy really special is that it has a um, dedication inscription uh, from Galileo to um, a fairly well-known character called Don Orazio Morandi. Um, Morandi was based in Rome, so down at the bottom, uh, below the, the plate there, um, you may be able to see a gift from the author uh, to Morandi, and it's even dated the 18th of November 1623, uh, which if I remember rightly is pretty soon after the first copies are appearing uh, on the market. Now, the, the other thing I should say about um, the what we learned from the, the watermarks is that by our estimates, there are probably, um, it's probably about maybe as many as 100 copies printed on fine paper. If you look at that ratio um, and you look at evidence from uh, the correspondence of the initial distribution of the book, Federico Cesi pays for 60 copies to be bound and distributed to cardinals and high ups just in um, in uh, Rome. And my guess is a, a lot of copies still survive in cardinals um, uh, gift bindings. So that, that claim of eight copies on fine paper is uh, to be discarded and replaced with a, a more sensible claim of maybe somewhere between 60 and 100 copies uh, printed on, on fine paper. This is an ordinary paper copy. So those uh, initial uh, kind of gift copies have gone out and the, the book is now commercially for sale, although the whole enterprise is, is underwritten by the fabulously wealthy uh, Prince Chesey, who um, isn't doing this for commercial, he's not trying to make money and Galileo's not making money off this. They're trying to... Um, win friends and influence people and usher in a, um, a a world where Copernicanism can be spoken of again um, without fear of prosecution. So what we have here is maybe a kind of second wave of, um, of dedicatory copies. Um, as I say, there aren't many of these that we know of. This one goes from Galileo to Morandi. Um, Galileo probably knew Morandi from his childhood. They were in the same monastery together. Galileo, for a, a brief period, uh, schooled at, um, in Vallambrosa. Morandi went on to become a, a monk and the general of the order of the Vallambrosan uh, Benedictines. And he was transferred. Um, he had a kind of a strange relationship with Galileo. He initially, because of his patronage networks, um, when Galileo announced the discoveries in the Sidereus Nuncius, uh, Morandi seems to have been on the side of Galileo's critics, but then in 1613 he gets converted and um, and writes to Galileo, you know, my bad, you're right, um, let me know if I can be of any help. 
and there are, there's a handful of letters be between the two of them right up to um, 1630. Uh, Morandi sends Galileo a Kepler book that he's uh, trying to get hold of and can't get through commercial markets. Um, Morandi is well known in Rome uh, as the abbot of the monastery of San, uh, Santa Prasede, uh, a beautiful Byzantine monastery just south of uh, Termini train station now. Um, that li uh, And he assembled a library there, uh, which became a kind of countercultural um, center. It had lots and lots of banned books, which is a kind of weird thing for a, um, a Benedictine uh, monastery to have and to be known to have. And there are lots of records of people visiting this library to consult the, the banned books. Mirandi, um, Mirandi also was a practicing, um, not only an astronomer, but an astrologer. Uh, and a shaker and mover in Baroque Rome and um, uh, somebody who's thought that he could read the political tea leaves really well and also intervene in that world, um, increasingly brazenly. Um, so between 1628 and 1630, he starts to cast horoscopes uh, predicting the imminent death of the Pope. Not a wise move. Uh, in 1630, he's arrested uh, and he dies in the Inquis Inquisitor's jail in 1630. There are rumours that he's been poisoned. The official story is he had a bad fever. Um, now, this is interesting not only because it's uh, it's right before Galileo's trial and Galileo is um, tied to Mirandi in contemporary accounts. Some people thought that Galileo had actually cast the horoscopes that Mirandi was using. So just two years before or three years before Galileo's trial, uh, he's uh, a fellow traveler with uh, this dangerous character, Mirandi. The, the other thing that's uh, quite cool though is when, um, when they arrest Morandi, Morandi somehow gets wind of this before the arrest. And as the cops are on their way or the inquisitors are on their way, he gets his monks to hide all the banned books so that he can't, uh, they can't be used as evidence against him. And for several months, nobody uh, admits to this having happened when the inquisitors uh, come and ask them, you know, we know, we know that you're reading dodgy stuff. Where is it? until one of them finally breaks and realizes that his vow of um, obedience is with the, uh, not with his superior, but with the inquisitors and leads them to the cupboards and the, uh, some of them have been bricked up in a window. Some of them are hidden um, in various places behind the organ and stuff like that. And the inquisitors then compile a list of all of these banned books. Now, the, the Sagittori is not explicitly mentioned, and the Sagittori was not banned, but it was already, by 1630, a book that had received a couple of denunciations, which are now located in Galileo's inquisitorial trial file, um, because there's one of his kind of show-offy pieces, when he realizes he doesn't have much to say about comets, is to start talking about atomism and how um, how the universe is actually constituted of atoms rather than Aristotelian elements. And this gets denounced as heretical because if you have an atomic world, it's quite hard to, under to explain how the miracle of a, um, a Eucharist uh, can be explained because uh, under an, in an Aristotelian world, you can say it looks like bread, it tastes like bread, but it's actually something else. The body of Christ, but if everything's atoms all the way down, that becomes quite hard to to kind of uh, put a wedge in between appearance and reality. It just is, and so there are a couple of denunciations of Il Saggiatore, um, and famously Pietro Rodondi wrote this amazing book about thirty years ago called Galileo Heretic, uh, where he claims that that's what Galileo was really sent down for, not Copernicanism but for the much more troubling um, threat to the miracle of transubstantiation. Um, we do know from these inventories of uh, Morandi's library, when they found the books, the kinds of things that he was reading. And they include Machiavelli, um, people like De Dominis uh, in literary works, um, lots of Boccaccio, which had also been um, uh, placed on the, on the index, or at least until corrected. 
Um, and then lots and lots of Protestant science. So he's got his William Gilbert's um, book on magnetism. He's got the essays of Francis Bacon. He's got stuff like Paracelsus. He's got a copy of Copernicus. He's got Kepler. He's got lots and lots of alchemical works. Uh, there are several Galileo books that we know he had. Uh, so he had a Sidereus Nuncius. He had the book on um, why things float. Um, and so there's no explicit uh, mention of this particular copy, but there is no doubt that this copy was in the book stash in Santa pra Pracide in Rome uh, when Morandi was uh, arrested. Um, so that's basically where we'll stop. This is a fairly extraordinary association copy. Um, it's by far the, uh, I think other copies from Galileo that um, I can only think of a, a couple that I that I know of. Um, they're just a fairly predictable cardinals, and there's there's no um, there's no uh, kind of glamour to them as there is with this copy. So that that's where we'll stop. That's a description of the entire edition uh, and drilling down into the background around this particular copy. And at that point, I think we can maybe take a look at the copy and also open up the floor to um, questions or discussions or queries about why anybody would want to do the work that we did. Um, where does that get us? Over to thank, thank you both so much, Jason and Nick, for a wonderful talk. And also thank you for explaining the context around Galileo and Morandi. Um, because we have a, um, a people from all sorts of different backgrounds attending today. Before we look a bit more at the copy, I'm just going to put some links in the chat, being aware that some of you might have to leave early. So the catalogue record for our copy is there in the chat. And it comes from a collection uh, bequeathed in 1870 to University College London by... Um, Graves, and there's information in the chat on his collection, which is the most wonderful collection on the history of science. Um, and we have a couple of uh, subject guides to our uh, history of science collections, and I'm just going to put those in the chat there. Right, and so perhaps for a few minutes, um, while we wait for your questions to come into the chat, um, we'll, we'll have a have a look at some of the features that you mentioned, Jason. Um, so the first, this is very typical of our Graves collection binding. It's it's in a nineteenth century green binding, and he particularly favoured those end papers. We've got the portrait here. We were having a chat before that we think possibly that might be a copy, but it's bound. Um, First, so that fits, and then it's got the auction catalogue entry. We've looked at the title page. Um, so, Jason, do chip in, or either of you, for things that you would like. No, to... I mean, I will. I will uh, preclude the question about how we determined it, the first clue about figuring out the what. Uh, so, there's the okay. I should back up. So, here is a, as you see. So, the UCL copy has those preliminary poems. Um, which is great. There's the Faber and, and the Stelluti. Um, uh, I think the other clue that uh, for its location is also the, the catch words. Um, I mean, it's clearly intended to go before, but again, uh, because it appears in some and not in some presentation copies, it must have had a, a separate distribution network. And there on the right uh, in the UCL copy, um, is the beginning of that half sheet cancel. And so what we ended up doing was in several copies, um, asking people, and uh, like Nick said at the beginning, uh, this was very much in uh, a virtual international collaborative project. Um, so we had folks measure the, the distance between the chain lines, uh, which would have been conjugate on the quarto. Uh, and the distance between the chain lines in A1, A4, and A2, A3 was simply too great for it to be the same sheet of paper based upon the measurements uh, that we find in those sheets. And so that was kind of the conclusive physical evidence that this was a half sheet uh, cancel, uh, uh, conjugate cancel uh, that, that, that's put in A. 
uh, and you'll see this in hopefully in all copies, in all the copies that we saw and looked at. We've looked at 24, 26, 29, I think. Uh, yeah. Um, and so I just, um, yeah. And sometimes you find, you know, if you think of that sheet before it's folded up and made into a book, so that would be capital A, uh, basically pages one through eight of the of the text, so the the start of the uh, the text um, the text proper. Um, if you were to unfold that sheet, uh, you should have a big sheet of paper with a watermark and possibly a countermark on it. And what we were finding, so when you fold that um, once, you get a folio; twice, you get a uh, quarto. So that's what we're dealing with here. Um, you should only find one watermark on that sheet. And what I found repeatedly, the first thing that tipped me off to, to this was I found two watermarks. So both A14 and A23 both had watermarks on it. So that meant that they were both half sheets. And I thought, well, maybe this book, this particular copy has been repaired. I couldn't make sense of it. And then I saw it again, and then I saw it again. And then I realized, oh, it's because of the textual content. It's because... Uh, Don Virginio Cesarini is Maestro di Camera, the uh, Nostro Signore. That's what's changed. And there's a letter where Galileo is sent early on in the printing process. He's sent sheet A and sheet B as so that he can wave it around to his enemies in Florence and say, you see, I've got a printing license. The book is going ahead. This is the evidence. Um, but that sheet the originally printed sheet A must have had Cesarini's former job title. He was already the dedicatee, but he wasn't yet, yet the maestro di camera. So that's what required the, the reprint. And that's why uh, you get sometimes zero watermarks in A because both the half sheets were the unwatermarked halves, sometimes two, sometimes one. So this is, this is a way that the material evidence that the book um, provides fits in with the social uh, evidence about the, the book's production. And uh, it's only by reading both of those together that you can really fully understand how the object came to be as it is. Is that, is that clear to everyone? Um, yeah, yeah, that, that's absolutely wonderful. So it shows that those um, parts of our training on watermarks and collation that many people hate are really, really important because they, yeah, no, they really tie in with the more interesting, larger questions, yeah. Yes. And the, the other thing to point out, the other part, you know, the, the so why am I learning this if you're an MA student uh, doing a book history course or something, or, or you're an undergrad doing an English course and they keep talking to you about print shops and you want to talk about authors, um, you realize that authors are not making books printers are making books and book binders are making books and there are all of these technical things that happen in the production that are not representative of authorial intention um and so things like this the page 120 um oops they just printed it upside down remember of course that um the images in this book because they are engravings uh have to be printed separately so the text would be printed on one press um the, the composed text, and then it gets sent off to a different um, different kind of press. You need much higher pressure, and the gap is filled in with the, the images. And obviously, the um, the plate was just placed upside down on the on the on the press. So all copies had this printed the wrong way up, um, and then somebody had to go in probably over a, a long weekend and print off uh, six hundred individual little ones of these things and cut them up um there's no way of just uh selecting you know copying and printing a sheet of of 20 of these things and cutting them up like postage stamps you'd have to do it uh over and over and over again 600 times um or maybe you didn't because here's one that never received a, a paste down and it also th this kind of evidence lets you um understand that we we still talk about early modern books in the way that we from a framework that's produced with with modern books we think of a book being published as though it's this act or printed and published and here we have this bizarre kind of you know how do you how do you track down a once if copies are already for sale that have not been corrected how do you get the paste down correction 
to the readers? Do you leave a stack in the bookstore and say, if you bought this book, you'll love this correction? Or do you um, do you call back copies? I mean, um, do you send it to the patrons and say, I sent you this book, but now you have to stick this on, on page 120? Similarly with the, um, with the errata. Uh, the book has been published, and then uh, Galileo's furious that the editor, Tommaso Stili uh, Stiglioni, um, had done such a shoddy job on it um, and orders this uh, a different errata sheet to be printed. But then in this in this case, um, the author's errata sheet is discarded by the guy who's paying for the book. And that's why there's a third errata sheet, as, as Jason showed you, um, a compromise errata sheet issued. So the, even the author, the editor's not in control of the book. The author's not in control of the book. Here, the patron is is, is in control of the final textual uh, state of the book. So the, the book is circulating in three different states uh, with three different um, intentions of, of what it's, what how it's meant to read. And that's reflected in the physical makeup of the book. You have to go in and tip this, uh, tip this sheet in there. So you can see that little, those couple of millimeters there of double thickness are the clue that uh, alerts you to the fact that there was a social dispute about meaning that had to be um, mediated uh, by patrons, authors, editors, and um, printers. Um, and you have this bizarre scenario as well. The book is printed in Rome, but Galileo isn't in Rome. Um, so he prints his errata sheet off in Florence. So in effect, you have a, a book that's kind of printed in two different locations in some copies. Um, and uh, the um, the other form of the sheet is is printed again in, in uh, Mascara's print shop in, in Rome. So uh, multi-location and trying to trying to reconstruct the networks to fix the broken book. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Nick. I'm just aware of time. Seamus has been waiting very patiently with his question. He says 600 copies were printed. We know that, which is fantastic to know. Thank you both very much. Seamus asks, do we know how many now remain? Oh, one can never know, but um, uh, do you have an idea? Yeah, that there was a critical edition, a pretty good critical edition, apart from its bi the bibliographical apparatus is, um, needs to be revised in light of uh, um, Dean and Wilding's first publication. <laughs> but they, uh, so this was an edition from 2005 by an Italian team, um, uh, Be Bezomi and Helbing. They said that they were going to uh, produce a census and that they had uh, charted 120 copies at that point. So at least 120, if that's reliable, which is a pretty high survival rate. For the Sidereus Nuncius, we have a, a um, an edition size of 550 copies. It's quite rare that we know edition sizes. It's only when you, you can't reconstruct that really from the book itself. They don't say one of 600 copies. Um, so it's only really with secondary or other primary sources that you can usually um, do anything more than an educated guess. Um, Sidereus Nuncius, similar survival rate, uh, 550 copies, about 105 surviving. So one in five. There's a, a general rule is bigger books linger longer. Um, not always true. But the pricier the object, um, the more likely it is to survive. By this time, by this point in time, um, Galileo is a famous person, and people know that this is not just ephemera to throw away. It's not going to go out of date, and and it also because Chesey binds up these sixty copies for cardinals who probably never opened the book, but had institutional uh, longevity on their side. Uh, they would probably give their their books to um, institutional libraries, which would then, uh, you know, you're, you're not in the wild west of the, the private market where stuff just gets rained on and trashed by your kids who don't appreciate the same things you do. So there might be a uh, an even higher survival rate for this. So we think at least 120, it could be, it could be higher than that. Yeah, I, I will say, uh, Jamie Cumby and I, my former colleague, Jamie and I did a piece on, um, Principia, where we talk about a couple of the same objects, which is um, 
that it, it, much like Galileo, when Principia arrived on the scene, um, that people recognized it as an important book, and a lot of them also went to institutions, and so the survival rate for I, I think that's shared between even though there's almost a hundred years difference there. Uh, between those, between Galileo's works and Principia would, would be similar. You'll see a higher proportion of those copies of our Yeah. And of course, that is always the question that students ask when we take the first edition Newton Principia to their first lecture. Um, that's fantastic. I'm aware that some people uh, will, will need to leave. So if you do, thank you very much for staying with us. If you'd like to, to hang on for extra questions, just just type them into the chat. I've got the million dollar question for you, Nick. Um, do you think our inscription is genuine? Yeah, it strikes me as, well, I mean, there, there is enough contextual evidence that the two of them are um, are in touch in this period. And it's the kind of th a gift that Galileo would have given to Mirandi. There's no, there's no kind of, it's, it's not a weird thing for, for him to have done. The reason, the only reason I hesitate, hesitate, is that there is on the market at the moment. A, I said I wasn't going to mention this, Jason, but I'm going to. Uh, there is a uh, copy of a um, Dante Divine Comedy, apparently, with going the other way from Mirandi to Galileo. Um, and I'm not sure that that one's genuine, um, or that the inscription is genuine. It's in Mirandi's own binding with with um, apparently his uh, his armorial his device is a Moore's head for Mirandi, uh, and it says on the book, you know, on on the binding. This is Orazio Mirandi's uh, uh, binding. Seems a little good to be true, almost, um, and just. Because I don't trust the dealer, to be perfectly frank, I'm not entirely uh, comfortable with with that. But but your one, I, I can't see why anybody would fake this. It's not it's not high enough stakes. It's not the kind of thing that would have been. It, it wouldn't have increased value, I don't think. Um, and it makes sense. So and it looks, you know, there's nothing about the writing that looks hesitant or you know, the ink hasn't isn't too dark or too light. It, it looks. It looks right to me. So hopefully, yeah. Um, That's reassuring for us. And it would have been bought by Graves probably in the mid 1800s. And at that point, you know, I think that the Santa Prasida Library had been, I don't know what happens after the Inquisition comes in and, and raids it. I don't know what happens to the non banned books. We have inventories before that from 1600, but I don't, don't know what happens afterwards. Uh, probably it, that library gets dispersed because it's um, it's too dodgy, uh, and and the book might have floated on the on the market for or been. We we don't know what happens between sixteen thirty and Graves getting hold of it. Um, the, I see a question that I think might have been sent only to me, so I, I, I'm going to share it. It's um, from David Shaw, and it says, "Was the type of signature a? Um, I think that's a big the the re the." the A14 thing to Cesarini, was it reset uh, or was standing type modified to change Cesarini's job title? Good question. This is the kind of question we love. We don't know because there are no surviving examples of pre-cancel um, A that we've come across. My guess is um, as the job title change only comes into effect as the book is nearly finished printing, and that this was one of the first sheets to be printed, that the standing, the type wouldn't have stood for that long because they just didn't have enough type. It would have been um, all taken apart and, and had to be completely reset. It, it, it's the same kind of type, uh, but I don't think it's probably just, I mean, that would have been the simplest solution, but it would be extremely rare for them to leave an entire book in standing type. Um, I mean, they, they could only leave a few sheets at a time, especially if they have all these other jobs going on, even a, a large printers like that, which would have had, um, I'm not sure how many uh, complete sets of, of type, but um, in all likelihood, uh, completely reset. Good, good question. Thank you. Lovely. Thanks, David. I don't know if you want to um, add anything to that. You can unmute or undo your switch your video on if you if you'd like to.
And if anyone finds in their copy of a Sagittore that they're sitting with at home, that it doesn't have that job title for Cesarini, we'd love to know. Because that would be, it's possible that some of those slip through without being uh, ripped in half and, and added to it. It's a, it's a pain. Um, but we do know that it was spotted before the book was ever distributed. That one wasn't a kind of catch up and fix it. Uh, that was that was done before any copies were distributed. So if they, but as you've seen, the um, Muscardi print shop was a bit of a mess. So it could be that at some point, uh, an uncorrected version of that shows up. You see that with other other books. And if anybody wants to see another very nice example of an engraving printed upside down because of the complexity of having to put the sheath through again, um, there's a nice, much earlier example from our 1481 Dante project during lockdown. Um, the copy comes from the Bodleian Library, and you can see a video of that event on the UCL Special Collections YouTube channel. Um, it's a very nice, it's uh, both uh, not straight and upside down. I think at least this one's straight, <laughs> just, well, pretty much. I'll just give us a few more questions, a few, few more minutes in case anybody else has got any more questions. There's a question uh, from Dr. Nan. Is it walnut ink? Is that the for the inscription, I imagine? Um, probably oak gall. Um, in most, uh, I don't know if, uh, I don't know if well, walnuts used at this point. Usually you take um, the galls that wasps lay little things in, in oak trees and they swell up into these little tumors and then you grind that up and, um, and that's what, um and adds um it's a water-based ink whereas the printing ink is oil-based um and that's what gives it the brownness which will also change over time um and it, it can sometimes go slightly purple the argo ink yeah that is galileo's handwriting i i am 90 percent sure of i'll i need to yeah, I think that that is, I'd, I'd previously not registered that, but I think that that is Galileo's own handwriting. Uh, so an actual dedicatory, not just a, I received this from Galileo and I'm going to write that into the book. Um, so, and it's it's quite cool to have a, a dated one like that because the you can pretty much, you can chart you know, when individual copies of this book are being distributed, the waves, the kind of, relentless propaganda war that uh, Chasey is trying to orchestrate um, in Rome uh, with this new this new Pope who's Galileo friendly. He's a personal friend. Um, and Galileo really thinks this is the moment when uh, the potential rift between science and religion is going to get healed up and we're going to start um, talking sense again and get Copernicanism back on the books and um, and that the Lynchian is going to be the motor that culturally that drives that um, that healing process. So, um, on the other hand, he's doing stupid things like giving a book to Mirandi, who's about to predict the death of the Pope. So, um, Galileo, not always the savviest um, courtier, as you see from uh, what happens to him in 1633. Lovely. Uh, have you got any other questions that have come through to you directly? Sorry, did I interrupt you? No, I, we clearly did such an excellent job there that we answered all, all questions that could ever be asked to this book. Does anybody else know of any anyone out there, um, if you're still listening, um, any other studies that go through watermarks like that and show um show similar or completely different patterns because i was really surprised at the uh that even something like a, a fine paper copy or an ordinary paper copy that the distinction wasn't clear it was more a kind of sliding scale of niceness um so i was just wondering whether that struck anybody else as abnormal or normal there's a hand up at the top yes Go ahead, David. Yes, I, I'm muted. Um, uh, Paul Needham uh, at uh, Princeton 
is the great expert on all of this and has done enormous work, but of course, very much in the incunabular period, pre-1500. Pre but he, he's got interesting patterns of paper stocks being used in peculiar ways, but it's not relevant, I think, for your case. It's far too much in the historic right. early days of uh, printing. He did, of course, do this work, too, for the Sidereus Nuncius. And there he found, yeah. I mean, and he was there the first, he was the first person to identify a fine paper issue of the Sidereus Nuncius. But there it seems like it's much, much clearer. All the ordinary paper copies are ordinary in the same way. And all the fine paper copies are fine paper in the same way. And there's not, but I think that's just a, a smaller operation with less paper to choose from. Um, but it could be, yeah, it could be that asking Paul um, or just seeing whether there's more standardization in an early print shop. Uh, and it may well be that you get clues about how many jobs are being done concurrently. These kinds of things that are very hard to reconstruct unless you have a ledger book or some other kind of external documentation. Um, the paper stock, I mean, it's it's tedious work, but the the obvious thing to do here would be to go and look sideways at other mascardi books from 1623 and see what papers appearing in what other publications although i'm not sure what the take-home would be apart from it's the same or it's different mm. um, have you managed to identify to, to match the world of any of the watermarks we've got pretty yeah we've got pretty close so the images jason pulled up are uh, are those all from briquet or are they um and some of them are you know, obviously watermarks change over over time and we um and some of them were are very hard to see so you know i see a small fat bird and somebody else sees uh a particular breed of duck or something we, we it's it's like a rorschach test sometimes but um and because of it's a quarto book and so they're deep in the gutter and if your copy is tightly bound it's very hard to get in there and see these things at all um, but some of them do seem to to match up with known um, known Mascardi uh, stock, and the assumption is that most of this paper is coming from obviously paper's heavy, it's expensive, it's hard to shift. It would be locally produced, um, so you you know probably a year in the National Library of Rome would give you a fairly exhaustive um, and exhausting uh, research project. To uh, to work out what all available Roman paper stocks in 1623 look like, but again, I'm not sure whether it's worth the um, worth the blood, sweat, and tears. It's just a very nice example of um, using what you've got to hand in the workshops now. Yeah, and as well, you know, to that that kind of the, one of the other take home lessons of you know wh why are we studying bibliography? Uh, why do we have to learn all this stuff? Um, no two copies of this uh, mechanically reproduced book are materially identical, even before you get to marginalia and binding. Physically, the paper is different. Like that's that's a, that's not true of a modern book. So um, just in, in terms of historicizing book production in a very immediate way, this is a, a nice little uh, piece of data. Wonderful, thank you. Um, and thank you for that. Thank you for that, David. Um, right, I think that we're ready to wrap up unless people have other questions. A huge thank you to Nick and to Jason. Um, it looks as though it's almost daylight now for you, Jason. <laughs> um, we really, really appreciate your expertise on, on our copy. Um, and it's fantastic to see this particular copy being fitted into a larger pro larger project where you, you, you've actually examined an, enough copies to get a picture of the production and also to be able to fit that into the political and the, and the social context. I think that's just a, a, a model example of historical bibliography um, in action for the bigger questions. So 
Uh, a huge thank you to both of you. Um, we're really pleased about that new information about our copy, and we'll try and get that into our catalogue record as, as soon as we can. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us in this, our last Red Books Club, um, and we look forward to seeing you at our similar event series um, in the summer. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.